Hello chaps and chapesses, and I am delighted to welcome you to the second part of our Bumphead Parrotfish on the Fly video uh, with Wesley de Klerk from Fly Castaway and who's explaining this week in our conversation the tidal phases, the approach, the presentation, the hook, strike and the fight and then the landing of these fantastic fish. So without further ado, let's just jump straight into it. <music> Let's talk about the process. So we're going to go out bump head parrot fishing. We're going to target them specifically. Let's start with tide phase. You have to keep in mind the size of the fish when thinking about that because obviously these are big bulky fish. They want to expend as little energy as they can when they're on the flat. So they don't want to be fish. I mean, swimming up into a very strong current, although it does happen. They're quite lazy by nature. Yeah, and they want sort of really stagnant water that they can happily go onto the flats and move up and down. So that would indicate that a neap tide is, is preferable mm -hmm. because you've got a very low variation between your high and your low and it gives them a lot more time on the flats. Your spring tides, although we do catch them in spring tides, it's, you don't catch as many, no doubt. And because your water movement is, is so much more pronounced during the spring tide, they have to expend a lot more energy to stay onto the, on a flat or in a specific area mm -hmm. that they're feeding. And as we know, fish would want to conserve as much energy as they exactly. possibly can. So, neap tides on a new moon neap tide cycle, that's absolutely that's key. Favorite. Yeah, that's my personal favorite. Yeah, okay. We catch them on neap tides across the board. I suppose with spring tides, your window is just going to be much, much smaller. 100%. Like most situations when you're fishing on a spring tide. Yeah. Whether it's GTs or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, Fast and frantic. But it applies more specifically to the bumpers mm -hmm. because of the bulk of those fish. Um, they really are big fish and for them to keep in, I mean you've been onto Prov and you've seen how those flats drain off on a drop. Yeah. For a bumpy to maintain position and feed actively in that, it, it's really not viable for them. Yeah. The full moon cycle can be really good for them, but we have found in certain seasons that for some other reason, whether it be a mating ritual or whatever the case may be, that they just disappear completely. Once one week a season on the new moon cycle, we don't see the bumpies. Isn't that They're great just though, there's a fish species gone. that we still know nothing about. Nothing, absolutely nothing. In fact, I don't think any research has been done, to my knowledge, on bumpies. So, you know, it's all speculative at this stage, and it's all trial and error. So but it's based on, you know, you have spent a lot of time on those flats, yeah. watching their behaviour, so it's based on... It's on observation. And observation. It's all observation, I mean it's... And every day you learn something new about them. Your approach to them differs from, you know, different tides and different water movements and how the fly is actually going to swing down and present onto them, so, you know, like we discussed, it's just so dynamic and it, it, you've got to factor so much into targeting them efficiently. They're not quite as moody as something like triggerfish or something like that, though, are they? Well, the triggerfish, he has to be, apart from a permit, he has to be the moodiest little fish that I know. <laughs> and that's what I love them. I mean, that's what excites me about It's going to be a whole fishing. different film. But we'll leave triggers for triggers, right? Triggers on another day. Um, okay, so let's go back to targeting bump heads specifically. Let's talk about... Um, so, we arrive on the flats, and then certainly in the examples I've seen, you know, we've seen those 
blue green tails flashing sort of 500 yards down the flat so sure. at that point What's, what's your, your next move then? The approach to those fish is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. If you don't approach them in the right direction, you've sort of reduced your chances of catching them by up to 75%. The way in which we approach them is to try and get up on top of them. So if they're moving from the deep water onto the shallow water, okay. you really want to be approaching them from the shallow to the deep. So you want to be anticipating where they're going to be coming so that you're presenting the fly full on right up onto them which means that you can actually present the fly let the fly get down into the area and, push them. and let them feed onto the fly mm -hmm. the angle when i talk about the angle so i'm going to talk like this so if the bumpies are moving that way the fisherman is standing here you want to be presenting straight down onto them so they can move up onto yep. the fly if you're so the fish if the fish are moving there and you're presenting from side on what you're going to be doing is you're going to be lining those fish all the time. So that increases your chance of far looking them, number one. Number two, it increases the chance of the line going over them and spooking them. And it also increases the chance of far looking them in the head. Yeah. Because now they're picking it up and going forward. And, and if you do move them, on, it also increases your chance of being chopped off by another member of the school. Exactly. So you want you ideally you want them feeding up onto you so that you can present before they get close to you, allow the fly to get down into the zone, and then let them feed up onto the fly. Yeah, that makes sense. A lot of the time they'll feed past you, and obviously you don't want to miss out on an opportunity. So the fishermen tend to try and rush the casts and get them from behind them. You're wasting your time. Mm. Rather pick up, move all the way around them, and, start again. and present again because that is by far the best technique to, to target them. Often when you've got a bit of a current going, you need to anticipate, you know, you need to keep that in mind. So you're actually swinging the fly down onto them, but you still want the fly to swing down onto them that they can feed up onto it. Even though you might be changing your angle ever so slightly, you still want that same effect that they're feeding off onto the fly. It also means you can present the fly a lot earlier and not sort of rush it. Mm. or rush the presentation and spook the shot. So you can allow the fly just to sit there and you just stay in contact the whole time. Okay, so let's just cover that quickly. So you've cast out, you've put the crab down in front of the school, the school's coming towards you, what do you do next? The important thing is to stay in contact with that line. They pick that, that fly up very subtly. So if you're not in contact with that line, you're not gonna feel that, that fish picking it up and you're gonna miss the set. So it's important once you've presented the fly, allowed to get down to the bottom, Stay, pick up all the slack and just stay in contact and sit with it. And just wait for that fish to feed up onto it. Don't strip the fly. If the school turns in e either which direction and you feel that your fly is now out of you know out Zone. of play, you can strip it into position, but then allow it to sink back down. Mm -hmm. Once again, we try not to follow these things. So allowing the fly to get down to the bottom without stripping it over the heads of them is really key. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to go up, we presented the fly, the fly's got down, the fish picks up the fly, you feel it. You got it, you, a lot of people are not able to differentiate between a 40 pound leader and a 25 pound leader or a 20 pound leader. And they go into a full blown set. And it happens often, especially on Providence, because, because you've got the to, GT mentality. Yeah, exactly, I was going to say, everybody's used to fishing for GT, so. Yeah, and you pull it and you, you overexert the power and you pop that fish off immediately. You've got to keep in mind that you're fishing a light tip, but especially at spooky schools of fish, and he does pick it up. You're fishing a thin gauge hook relative to a GT You're also fly. trying to set it into a fish, which is a bit like a tank. Exactly. So it's a bit tricky. You need to put enough force into the set to set the hook, but not that you pop in the line, mm -hmm. obviously. And generally, once you've hooked him, then all chaos happens because the school erupts. <laughs> There's just white water, mud, and off they go in a, <laughs> back into the, the cow, pack attack, off they yeah. go. You really have to make sure you clear that line onto the reel. That's key. Don't let your running line get caught around anything because if it does, it, you know, you're going to yeah. snap that off immediately. Bang. And once it's on the reel, then your observation as to what is around you is key. And your guide should be able to so point you in the right direction. Like, like avoiding white holes in the middle of the flat yeah, and stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And not run into yes. sort of 
okay. potholes or anything that's, like that. That's, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Once you've got him on the on the on the reel and he's running off, a lot of well, in my experience, a lot of people start to stress because now all of a sudden they've hooked this massive fish and it's just peeled up for 150 meters of line. And the first thing they do is they start to tighten drags and pop it off. Mm -hmm. So a key, a key thing there is to make sure that your drag is set prior to the time to match your tippet class. Okay. So you don't want to over overcompensate, and you don't want to be really be changing your drag no. throughout the fight. Um, and in terms of the fight, I've always sort of thought in my head that there's like three stages of a milkfish fight. Mm -hmm. There's the there's the hooking section and the way it runs off with the school. There's the fighting it and trying to move it away from the school. Yep. And then there's the, the beating him to submission as quickly as possible so you can release it strong. Yep. I mean, would you would you concur with that? Would you add Yes to it? and no. And the reason Ooh, I say that is be because <laughs> bumpies all fight differently. Yep. It's not milkfish generally will fall into that three stage category. But bumpies, you'll often find that will fight very different. Some will fight very different to others. Some will go, you'll hook them, they'll run into a depression and then they'll just sit in the, in the depression. Others will just... He can't see me! Yeah, they'll go in. <laughs> and they, they might even go just, I mean, we've seen it often, where they just go under a turtle grass lip and then they just stay there. So that's why you often find the guide running to try and let, pick uh, up the line okay. and make sure that it's not going to touch on anything. But the other, the other thing that ha often happens is they just run and carry on running and then they stick with the school for a long period of time and then you better run after them yeah at the same time trying to pull him out of the school so you, you don't want to put too much over pressure it but you still want to try and get that fish out of the school as quickly mm -hmm. as you can it's but a, it's a hard but steady pressure isn't it yeah but I generally like you don't have control of that fish no. within the first 10 minutes he's got 100 percent he's got control on you um, and you just feel helpless. But that's what's so exciting about it. Yeah, sure. The one, the one thing that, that happened to me a couple of years back, and it's, it's quite interesting, it was the biggest bumpy that, that I've ever personally landed with a client. We hooked the bumpy, and the rest of the school spooked off, and it just stayed absolutely stationary, dead still. And at that point I thought, no, well, maybe he's hooked the bottom. That wasn't the case. <laughs> and as he pulled, the bumpy moved, and it went back. Needless to say, I went and got the net, lifted the line up and I netted the fish. And that was it. The Do you think it just didn't really realise what was going on? I have or? no idea. It just switched that fish off completely. Maybe it had been caught before and you knew, okay, well, this is just <laughs> going to be the easiest way to yes. get this I, I give up. I give up. Yeah. I give up. Just unhook me and then I'm going to swim away again and yeah. see my mates. But, I mean, that was a unique situation. It was really <laughs> absurd. For the first 10 minutes, most of the time, you've got absolutely no control of the fish. I also found you know, getting into the second stage of certainly that one that I landed on that last day, that constantly knocking it off balance <laughs> made the fight much, much faster. So yeah. by using the same rod techniques I was doing with GT, so if he's heading that way, I'm putting the rod over and putting the side strain and pulling his head down into the flat, mm -hmm. really, really did not like that. For sure. But that, is, that only is effective bit when you when you're in close proximity, so up to 30, 40 meters yeah, away. Further away I when he's 100 meters away, by you doing that, it does nothing. It does absolutely nothing. And the chances are you dropping your line mm -hmm. onto a potential coral piece or whatever the case may be. So I always discourage that. Mm -hmm. And a high rod angle so that you've got enough pull on the backbone is really important because you, you just elevate the line above anything that can cut you off and um, you then pull from there. So when it comes to landing these things, it can be pretty tricky, it can be quite tense. Very tense. Very. Especially when you've lost six. Or eight. Or eight beforehand. We've got a we've got an unwritten <laughs> ratio that generally you should hook between six and eight and you'll land one. Let's not so get ahead of up, ourselves yet. <laughs> <laughs> the landing aspect of course is is can be so classic because if you're not prepared for bumpies and you haven't got a net with you, you then need to dive tackle or rugby tackle. Or these the lanyard in the beak trick. That, that works well. That's probably the best way if you don't have a net. But it's still tricky because... It's, they're so slimy. Yeah, there's no way you're going to walk up and just They're, they're not like up. any other fish I've ever tried to handle. I mean, they are slimy and slippery and trying to hold on to something which is 
that big, with a big beak that actually wants to just remove your various digits, can be really, really intimidating. Sure. I mean, the, their caudal is so wide as well. You so can't the, wrist them or... And their tail is not rigid, so if you grab them by the caudal, your hand tends to just slip off. So the best way is to try and cradle it. Mm. So going up, once the fish is tired obviously, and you try and cradle it, leave that up to the guides because yeah, they will, they they'll get they'll get bullied by the fish and the chances are they're going to drop the fish. It happens all the time and you just cradle it nicely. But these days you guys are all carrying that. All the time. And we know the flats that we're going to get bumpy. So you always you know anticipate that you're going to get them there and you take the net with you. But often you get caught off guard mm. and you don't have a net. And the most effective way is to use the lanyards that we have and you move up onto the fish. You lanyard it basically directly between the mouth, pull it over the bump of the head and then you grab the tail. So you've got complete control of that fish wherever yeah. and, then, and then walk him back and take photos and whatnot. And then while in the water preferably. Yeah. And then we can unhook him and get him back quickly. Yeah. They tend to release really well. A strong fish. They're very strong. So we've never really had, had any fish that, that have shown any sign, even after long extended fights of complete exhaustion or anything like that. They tend to release straight away and off they go. Oh, they're great. They, they're lots of fun. I can't wait to get back at them again next year. Soon, soon. I know, it's exciting. Soon, soon. Well, that really just leaves me to say thanks a lot, Wesley. Thanks for coming along. Thanks cool. for telling us all your trade secrets. And uh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, please like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. See you next time. Oh, 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 oh,